Please, we can get started. A, a, a pleasure. We don't do much introduction, but that right. It's a pleasure to welcome back Rabbi Helfgott, who's given a number of classes for us, and he's, of course, the rabbi of um, Tishba. Why did this slip my mind? Of, of Netivat Hashalom in uh, in Teaneck, New Jersey. He teaches at uh, SAR. He's uh, organizes the Yom Iyun for Tanakh for YCT, and uh, teaches and writes and uh, is Mar Beach Torah in many avenues. And it's a pleasure to have him. On, on Tisha B'Av. Bakasha. Thank you, uh, Jay. And it's uh, always a pleasure um, to speak for Torah in Motion. I, you know, it has a very special place in my heart. Um, so Jay, just wanted to ask you, so with the source sheet that I sent, so how, how is it accessed? I will put it in the chat box in one second. If you, okay. if you prefer not sharing because you want to see people, that's okay. It's up to you if you want to share. You are co-host, so you have the the. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just want to go through some and focus on some yeah, text. So yeah, I, I'll put it up in in a second. Okay. I'll start, I'll go to the website. I'll, I'll put it. Okay, up. so let me start. Um, one of the famous uh, ideas that Rabbi Soloveitchik, we just mentioned Rabbi Soloveitchik. Rabbi Soloveitchik in his lectures on Tisha B'av emphasized is that Tisha B'av, um has a very unique theological standing. In addition to uh, mourning and lamenting, uh, we also allow ourselves um, the uh, theological audacity, if one could use that term, uh, to challenge uh, and question uh, God at certain moments. In the keynote, uh, we there are keynote, of course, which are very traditional in the sense that um, that we said this morning uh, in the context of we recognize that we as a community sinned. Um, the Paitan uh, mentions various sins that are mentioned in Tanakh and that are mentioned in Chazal in the, in the rabbinic tradition as the source of the destruction and as the source of why we suffered. But there are other keynotes, uh, which we said this morning, which have not a hint of that which simply call out to God, how is it that you allowed uh, your people who you took uh, in love at Sinai, you know, the, the people who you took in love, how is it that you allowed them to suffer so greatly? And you didn't remember the Berit Avot and you didn't remember all the promises that you made in Brit Ben Abtarim and many other keynote where we have statements like that, where the traditional is not mentioned at all, but there's a challenge to God's uh, justice and a challenge to God's uh, recognition, you know, um, um, sense uh, to our sense of fairness. And we protest God. And that's part and parcel of Tisha B'av. And Rabbi Salvechik, of course, um, developed this idea that in a sense, we take license from Eicha itself, where parts of Eicha challenge the Rabboni Shalom's uh, fairness and justice, and also parts of the, parts of, uh, the Nevi'im, which do as well. So I wanted today just to quickly um, look at uh, the tradition of challenging the Rabboni Shalom uh, within the Jewish tradition. I, even, in the, even in Christian writers, they often speak of this as the Jewish tradition of protesting to God, uh, as it's a very Jewish notion. I want to talk about a little bit of the, we have to sharpen it a little bit and see that there was a tension within, even in the Bible, and even in Chaz and certainly in Chazal about the legitimacy of the protest, uh, and then look at different a couple of sources and uh, note uh, some of the the famous passages and and how daring some of uh, Chazal uh, were. Uh, again, I'm not going to deal too much with the medieval uh, literature today because um, we said a lot of it this morning in the keynote, and they expressed themselves in the piyutim. Uh, in Slichot and in the keynote, uh, a challenging uh, a God. Uh, for example, one of the themes that you find in, uh, especially in the Middle Ages, 
uh, becomes a major theme in some of the more daring keynote and slichot is the idea that while Amis, while uh, Avraham Avinu was ready to offer his son um, as uh, an akeda, as, a, as an offering, uh, we in the Middle Ages, the Jewish communities that martyred themselves in worms and mines and spires and all the various kihilot, that we are in a sense we were greater than, than Avram and Yitzchak and that we offered direct sacrifices and God's hand did not, the Malach didn't step in and stop those murders and tragedies from happening. And so that's a theme that you find in medieval literature and challenging God and asking God, um, how could he allow this to happen? Um, but I wanted to go back to the beginning. So let me uh, click on the sources and let me then, um, let me see if I can go to share here and I'll share my screen and hopefully it'll show up, yeah. So I wanted to look at some sources. Of course, when we look, uh, we always start with the Bible. We start with the Tanakh. Um, what are the sources uh, of, of the legitimacy uh, the precedent for challenging God. And one of the earliest precedents, of course, is Avraham Avinu uh, in the story of Sodom. HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells Avraham Avinu that, um, that he will destroy Sodom. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu, um, says that Abraham will teach his children Tzedakah Mishpat. He's going to teach them the way of the Lord. And therefore, I cannot hide from him what I'm about to do. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to Avram, Ayomar Hashem, Zakat, Sidon, Vamarak, Kirabah, Vachatatam, Kichavda, Maod, Erdana, Vareak, Kitzakata, Habaa, Eli, Asukala, Vimlo, Eidaa. So Abraham is told that there is, I'm going, I am going to check and see the Tzaka. Tzaka in the biblical uh, term is not just to cry out, but it's crying out because of oppression. When the Jewish people are in Egypt, Vayitz, Aku, El Hashem. Uh, later on in the legal material in the, in the Torah, uh, when the Torah talks about taking the collateral or taking the clothing away from the ani uh, to hold as collateral and says, you don't, and if you don't return it to him, later on in Tanakh, we have many stories of the Isha, the forlorn woman who cries out to the Melech, Vayitzak el HaMelech, you know, my, my, my husband uh, died and then they took my son, all these kinds of stories. So this oak refers to oppression, to Bein Adam L'chaveiro. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says this to Avram that he's going to destroy. God forbid, Abraham challenges God's justice based on the objective principle of justice. You who are the God of justice, how can you allow this to happen? Will you kill the righteous with the um, with, 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 will you kill the righteous together with the with the with the evildoers? And what's striking here uh, in this context is God doesn't respond to Abraham, shut up, puny little human being. Who are you to challenge uh, my ways? Who are you to put me in the court on the dock to be judged by some objective standard of justice? Whatever God says is right. God does not do that. God does not, first of all, reject Abraham's right to challenge the Rabbon Shalom. Number two, God does not say to Abraham, you have no idea of what you're talking about. But what God does do is he engages Abraham in a back and forth to show that what God is doing is legitimate and falls in within the canons of justice and Sedek and Mishpat. So it's very, very striking. Parenthetically, this is a very famous passage because it 
uh, it relates to the you know a famous question uh, that has um, that was formalized in the Western tradition um, in uh, in Plato's um, in Aristotle's uh, what you call it um, uh, dialogue um, in I'm sorry in Plato's dialogue the Euthyphro in which the question is raised um, do the gods because they believed in gods, we believe in one God, do the gods do that which is holy because it is holy, or is it holy because the gods command it? So the famous question, turn the word holy here into good, just, right, um, is something objectively good because God commands it, and it has absolutely, has no relation necessarily to uh, ethics at all, a kind of uh, almost Yeshaya Leibovitchian ex extreme view, or is it good because God, in fact, in general, does the good? And we assume that God, uh, as we say in the text in Hazinu, uh, uh, that God is fundamentally just and good, and therefore we hold, and that just and good standard is something that human beings can access, it's not simply some sort of Hellenistic or Western construct, but it's something that human beings rationally can access. And the Rabon Shalom is held up to that here by Avraham, and it's legitimate. It's not seen as something Khalil of Achas, as blasphemous uh, in any way. So this is the most famous example in Sefer Bereshit. Of course, we also have uh, Moshe Rabbeinu, even if I didn't go to Exodus 32, but we also have the Moshe Rabbeinu challenges the Rabbon Shalom at the beginning of the Exodus story, where uh, when the first time that he comes to Paro and he says, Lama, and he's unsuccessful in taking out the Jewish people from Egypt, and Moshe Rabbeinu doesn't simply accept it, but he cries out to God, Lama hare ota la'am hazel, lama ze shlachtani, right? He says, why did you uh, do evil to this people? Lama ze shlachtani. And again, in the Pshuto Shal Mikra there, God does not say to, eight, to Moshe Rabbeinu, shut up, you puny little human being. You have no understanding of the big, picture of Jewish history and God's plan and how it's supposed, to, God, so to speak, again on the pshat, accepts what Abraham, what Moshe Rabbeinu said and then tries to show him and reinvigorates uh, the Brit. And he promises to, to Moshe Rabbeinu that know that this is part of Jewish history and you're going to be, take them out of Egypt Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. He encourages Moshe. He um, gives Moshe more support. He doesn't simply throw Moshe out on his ear um, as saying you're a mechutzaf or you're a heretic or anything like that. The same thing when Hakadosh Baruch Hu tells Moshe that the people have sinned at the golden calf, um, and the hatahanichali let me alone again in terms of pshat. God is saying, leave me alone and I'm going to destroy the people. And Moshe Rabbeinu does not leave them alone. Let not the Egyptians say that God is a demonic uh, power. And of course, remember, remember the, your servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God, uh, in effect, recants and Vainachem Hashem al Hara'a Asher Diber La Sot Lamo. God recants and allows them. So here, too, Moshe Rabbeinu challenges God, doesn't simply accept as a fait accompli what God says, and is willing to very strongly. And in the, again, in the picture in the Midrash, the Midrash has it as, you know, again, the Midrash uh, has a daring personification as if Moshe Rabbeinu held God by his lapel or by the, you know, Kaviyachal, the Gemara says that he held God by his cloak and said, I'm not leaving here. 
Vayichal Moshe, until you give them forgiveness. And Moshe Rabbeinu didn't simply accept um, as a kind of good soldier, God's initial statement. When we turn to the Nevi'im, we also see uh, many examples of the Nevi'im not simply accepting uh, God's uh, decree and not simply accepting what God had allowed, but challenging God and fighting with God. And so, for example, in a famous passage in Sefer Yirmiyahu, Perek Yod Bet, Sadiq ata Adonai ki ariv eilecha, ach mishpatim adaber otcha. I will fight with you. I will make a claim against you in court. I will put charges against you. Madua derech reshaim tzalecha shalu kol bogdei baged. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Why are the workers of treachery at ease? You natatem gam shorashi yalchu gam asu pri karovata befiem berachot mikil yoteim. And this is what they do. God, how is it that you drive them like sheep to the slaughter, prepare them for the day? Again, Yirmiyahu very, very much challenges God's justice. The same is found in Chavakuk, a very famous passage in Chavakuk. Chavakuk why do you continue to show me a world full of iniquity? Justice fails. Me'ukal, excuse me, therefore justice. So again, challenging the Rabboni Shalom's justice, challenging the Rabboni Shalom's fairness, challenging the Rabboni Shalom's way. And again, in all these passages, the Rabboni Shalom doesn't respond, shut up, you have no understanding of the big picture. Uh, this is blasphemous, this is heretical, you have no right to challenge God, but rather it is incorporated into the canon of the Tanakh and recognized as a legitimate protest of a religious um, um, prophetic call that the prophet doesn't only chastise the Jewish people, but he also in some places chastises the Rabbon Shalom. Similarly, in a number of famous Tehillim, Tehillim Mem Dalid, there is a lament Challenging God, you make you let them devour us like sheep. And again. This is not because presented as a consequence of sin, a legitimate punishment. Rather, we haven't been false in our connection. You crushed us. Did we forget the name of God? You can judge us. And again, so here, this statement of protest to God, that it's illegitimate. We haven't in any way rejected the covenant. And even after we've been punished, even after we've suffered, we haven't abandoned you, and yet we suffer. And we call out to God, Ura Lama Tishan, which we incorporate in the keynotes this morning. We also quoted that phrase, Lama Tishan, Kuma Ezratalanu. Also, the famous Kina, um, I'm sorry, the famous lament of the, of the Mishorer in Tehillim in Ain Dalid, which is incorporated 
into the one of the kinos, Zachor Mehayalanu, where we take one of the lines from this, this Mizmor as the second line of the Piyud, Zachor Mehayalanu. Maskila Asaf, Lama Elohim Zanachta Lanetzach, Yeshan Abcha B'Tzom Maritecha. Remember us, remember how you took care of us in the past. And here, what they're doing, they're destroying the Mikdash, Shilchu Ba'esh Mikdashecha, L'Aretz Chilu Mishkan Shmecha. Amru B'Libam Ninan Yachad Sarfu, Komo Adei El Ba'aretz. Ad Matai Elohim Yicharef Tsar, Yinatz Oyev Shimcha Lanetzach. Lama Tashiv Yadcha, why do you do this? You were once our king. You brought deliverance. You destroyed the sea. You created the sea monsters. You created the world. You created the day. You created the night. And again, no mention of sin, no mention of punishment. This is undeserved. Why do you allow the uh, enemies to, to uh, trample in the base of Mikdash? Why do you allow this? And you should arise, God. This, of course, is a major theme in the book of Job, in the book of Eov. Eov constantly, uh, in many passages, challenges God. In one of the more famous passages, it's in chapter 23. Vayan Io Vayomar Gamayo Maris Hiadi Kabdalan Hati, me ten Yadati Vamseo Avot Hunati, would I be able to reach God? I would put my case before him. Erhalafanav Mishpat to Fiamale Tochot, and I would put all kinds of arguments. A dami lim Yaneni Vavini Mayomarli, Haberov Koch Yarivi Madilo, Ahu Yasem B. Could he contend with me? Sham Yashar Nochach Imo. There I would be able to be cleared by him because he knows that I am flawless, I am innocent. And he would know that I would emerge pure as gold, etc., etc. So again, Job presents himself in that way. All of these passages and many, many more in Tanakh make it very clear that Tanakh, um, Bigadol, certainly not only allows, but it is a hallmark of the great Nevi'im and of everyone else. Uh, and of the great figures in Tanakh to challenge the Rabboni Shalom, to protest injustice, to question. Now, there is a, there are passages, of course, here and there, where God seems to shut down the protest. But again, it's a much smaller voice, but it is, for example, in the book of Job. God says to Job, Who is it? that speaks without knowledge. Where were you when I created the world? If you don't have the power to create the world, you shouldn't talk. Were you around when the morning stars came together? Who closed the sea? So this is a passage which is taken in some by some to imply God shutting down protest. And in Eov itself, there seems to be different statements from the Ron Shalom, because at the end of the book of Eov, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you know, to the friends of Eov, you spoke inappropriately to Eov, and Eov spoke well. And God restores Eov to his former glory, and he marries and he has children again. But there is this passage which seems to shut down Eov. So, Again, Bigadol, the thrust of Tanakh, <clears throat> excuse me, speaks to the legitimacy of challenging God and his justice. Uh, and it's a legitimate Jewish spiritual response. At the same time, there are passages, a smaller number, 
that seem to shut down that conversation. When we turn to Chazal, we turn to the rabbinic literature, we see this same tension played out in rabbinic literature. It's interesting that if you look, and this is especially, there's a wonderful book that was written on the topic of uh, protest. Um, it's called Pious Irreverence. Protesting, it's a great title. Pious Irreverence by uh, Dr. Dove Weiss um, uh, about the topic within uh, rabbinic literature. I just want to check because I'm not sure. Oh, I see in the chat, there's a lot of chats. Um, so let me just stop for a second. In the chat, the Dove Weiss book was mentioned already in the chat. It's very right. good. Okay. Um, um, Uh, ta, ta, ta. Okay. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Why don't teachers treat the students? Miss, Haki Miss Hakimi, I don't know the schools in which I teach in, that's not the case. I had never heard of a kid being told um, that they are chutzpahdik. But again, I teach an SAR. I'm sorry that your son had that experience. Um, yes. Well, I just want to say that all my grandchildren go to SAR and I'm glad they're <laughs> getting a better education. My okay. grandchildren in SAR. Yeah. But my son, all my boys went to Skokie Yeshiva. Oh, I'm and sorry so, for that, that that was yeah, part of their so experience. My son, Ari Hakimi, and yeah. Um, yeah. Isaac Hakimi, whose children you may have taught, who are all at SAR, they, right. they did not um, respond that way at Skokie. Right. But right. my third son was always treated with utmost disrespect by right. his teachers when he questioned. I'm sorry that Skokie, they did that. Okay, <laughs> anyway. so as I mentioned, as I mentioned- You are not here, allowed to ask questions like this. Okay, I'm going back. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, for those who want to expand on this, um, there is, uh, as I mentioned, and it was mentioned in the chat, uh, Rep, uh, uh, Dr. Dove Weiss has a wonderful book called Pious Irreverences. Um, and you can expand on many of the examples that I'm gonna mention here in rabbinic literature. Um, so, um, and of course, there's a very famous book that was published uh, in the 90s called Arguing with God by uh, Leitner, uh, which is also uh, has a lot of discussion about this as well. So just to show you, and one of the points that uh, Dr. Weiss points out is that uh, in the Mishnaic, in the Tanaitic period, what's interesting is that the voice of the Khan has much more uh, resonance. You find many more examples of the Khan rather than the pro voice. So for example, you have this passage from the Mechilta. The passage that we just read in Sefer Eo, V'hu echad umi yishivenu v'nafsho ivtavayas. So Darash Papus, there's a whole series of midrash, midrashic uh, dialogues between Papus and Rabbi Akiva. Dan yichidi, what's v'hu be'echad, that God is one? Dan yichidi l'chol ba'e o'ylam ve'in mi yashiv al dvarav. There is no one who can respond. Amalo Rabbi Akiva, Dayecha Papos, enough. Amalo Papos, Amalo Rabbi Papos, Umata Mekayim, Behu Bechad, Umi Yeshivenu. Rabbi Akiva, what do you take to mean the phrase Behu Bechad? Amalo, Ain Lahashiv Al Divrei Misha Amar Behaya Haulam, Eladan Hakol Beemet Vahakol Bedin. So Ain Lahashiv here means you can never challenge God. Rabbi Akiva was of the approach that one accepts, right? Rabbi Akiva is very famous for saying, Chavivin Yisurim, that, that afflictions of God are beloved and you should simply accept them. Rabbi Akiva, of course, in the Jewish imagination, in the Gemara, dies, Al Kiddush Hashem, V'ahavta uh, Hashem Elokecha, with the words of Ahavat Hashem on his lips. And here in the Mechilta, he says that explicitly, Ein lahashiv, one should not protest, respond to the one who created the world. El Adan, you should accept Sidu Kadin, that whatever God does 
is Bedin, Hakol Badin. Rabbi Akiva Omer, another passage from the Mechilta. Rabbi Akiva says, Lo ta'asun iti, right after the Aserta Dibrot, the Bible has this strange little passage at the end of Parsha Yitro, Lo ta'asun iti Elohei chesef Elohei zahav. Shalo tinahag, so a kind of a repetition of the second Dibra. Lo ta'asun iti. So the word iti literally translates together with me. So what does that mean? Shalo tinahagubi keder acherim minahagim biyirotehem. Don't act the way others, other religions and other people react to their gods. When good happens, they honor their God. But when terrible things occur, they curse their gods. If I bring upon you good things, you should, you should offer thanksgiving. What we call tzidu kadin, you should accept it. And here it's not just you should accept it, but you should give hoda'a. That's a very radical statement. You should give thanksgiving. God gave, God took. And what did the wife of Eov say to him? Are you still accept? You, shall, you should curse God and die. etc., etc. etc. Do you want me kedaber achat anevalot to daber? We gami tatov nikabel meit Elohim v'tara lo nikabel v'chol zot lo chata Eov bisfatav. In this version, Eov does not commit, and again, Eov is the paradigm at this point of not challenging God. However, later on in the book, Eov, as we saw, does challenge God and does protest to God. And so it's interesting that in another version of this, uh, not another version, but in other rabbinic passages, Eov is not seen as this great tzaddik. But Rabbi Akiva said, There are a number of people, a number of generations and people who, who serve out their full punishment in Gehinom for 12 months. Mishpat Dor HaMabul, Shnei Masar Chodesh. Mishpat Iov, Shnei Masar Chodesh. Iov is seen as a negative character because he challenged God. Mishpat HaMitzrim, Shnei Masar Chodesh. He's put into the same category as the Mitzrim and the Dor HaMabul, as the Egyptians and the generation of the flood that was killed into oblivion. Okay, take a quick look at the chat. Okay. Yes, that is definitely um, definitely a possibility. Dr. Berger points out that maybe hoda'a means here uh, acceptance and agreement could be possible. It's just interesting. The first part seems to be hoda'a as you know as 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 uh, as Thanksgiving because it says. You should be moda, and usually we take that. So again, unless you're, it's being interpreted in two different. How does Rabbi Kiva explain the last chapter of Eov? I don't know. Okay. Um, another very uh, famous section, another famous uh, passage is, of course, again, we're going to have to skip a little bit, but uh, another a Gemara in Tanit, Levi Gazar Tanita. Levi made a decree of a fast day because there was no rain. So he went up to heaven and he challenged God. And the, then the rain came. But as a punishment, he became a cripple. He became lame. A person should never uh, direct words of challenge, statements of harsh statements of challenge. Why God didn't you do this? Why God didn't you do that? 
Umani Levi. Again, here you have this, um, this tradition within the rabbinic tradition that limits and sees protest as a negative. In fact, even getting punishment, you get punished if you challenge God. Before, remember, we saw the passage in, in, uh, in Shemot where Moshe Rabbeinu said, Lama hare ota lama ze, lama ze, why have you caused evil to these people? That it's now worse for them. They have to pick their own straw. Which in the text, God doesn't respond too negatively. God, in fact, in effect, responds to Moshe and gives him encouragement and says to him, recognize I will take the Jewish people out. He kind of gives him chizuk. But in the Midrash, that's not the, that's not the point. In the Tanchuma, im amar adam legadol heimen olam ha-reota. Davar kasheu omer. Velo or, Moshe didn't just say that, but he said, umeaz bati el paro ledaber bishim chayra lamazeh. Amar lo ha-kadosh baruch hu, God says, chaval al da-avdin velo mishtakhin. Woe to those who are lost and are not remembered. Meaning, Moshe Rabbeinu, you don't live up to the, to the measure of Abraham. They never challenged. They never asked questions. They never doubted me. I told him to go and to the land and he would inherit the whole land. And what happened? And he had to, to bury Sarah. He had to spend 400 shekel. Velo here hair. He didn't challenge me. Amarti liYitzchak gur baaretz azot. I told Yitzchak that he would live in this land. Bikeishmaim lishtot velo matza. He couldn't find water in this land, and they fought with him. Velo here hair acharei midotai. Again, here the Moshe Rabbeinu is compared unfavorably to the Avot because he was mehar hair. On the other hand. We have, um, as especially as we move away from the uh, from the um, Tanaitic period, and we move into the Amoraic period, you have much more of the statement um, of of leg- going back to the biblical period and legitimizing protest before the Rabbonu Shalola. Very famous Gemara. It's in the same Gemara about Rabbi Akiva. Uh, Moshe Rabbeinu in the back of the class of Rabbi Akiva. Chazar, another part of that. Gemara, Chazar Ubali Fnei HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Moshe comes back after he sees the genius of Rabbi Akiva. Amar lefanav, Ribbono Shalom, yesh lecha dam kazev, atan otein Torah al yadi. You have such a wonderful person and yet you're going to give the Torah through me? Give it through Rabbi Akiva. Amar lo shtok, kach ala b'machshava lefanai. You showed me his great Torah. Moshe says, show me his reward. He saw that Moshe Rabbein, he saw that Akiva, Rabbi Akiva's flesh was being torn apart um, with, uh, in, like in a butcher shop, it says here as we read this morning in the Asara Haruge Malchut. And Moshe Rabbeinu cries out to God, Zu Torah v'zu schara. Now we have that also in the Ela Ezkara Piyut on Yom Kippur. And in the Ela Ezkara Piyut, the response is, Shtok, Kachi, right? Kachala b'machshava lefanai. This is what happened. And this is what we have here from the Gemara in Brachot. But if you have the same story, in Brachot, here it's very different. The famous story of Rabbi Kiva. And at this time, it's not Moshe that challenges. In this version, the angels challenge God. Amru Malachea Sharet, Lifnea Kadesh Barchu, Zu Torah Vizu Schara. In this response, 
The Rabbon Shalom does not respond, shut up. I'll turn the world back into Tovavo, but rather, which is one of the classical rabbinic responses to Russia, to Tzadik Viralo, that the righteous suffer. The response is no, Rabbi Kiva is, has a great portion in the world to come. A very different kind of response to the angels about this. Let me just check the chats. Yes, correct. Some people do make that distinction. The Avo did not complain about their personal issues. Moshe was complaining about the situation of the people. Okay. Okay, and not for himself. Okay, so why should that be different in this context, in the context of Moshe Rabbeinu in the Midrash? He should be more altruist. He's more altruistic. He's, he's, he's challenging God on behalf of the people, and yet he shut down in a way. Um, um, he was complaining about, again, yes, there are people who make that distinction, but in a certain sense, Moshe Rabbeinu, He's not, he's not questioning him about himself. Okay. Um, and if we continue, we see some even more daring exegesis. The rabbis were willing to say uh, in, in Shmot Rabbah, which is an Amoraic um, uh, text, in terms of its final editing, late Amoraic, Malamit Shloyama Vakesh Ligol Yisrael Ala Amar Moshe Lakarish Baruchu. Who am I? Moshe Rabbeinu challenges God, and the rabbis here interpret me anochi not as referring to Moshe, I am, but me anochi. Who are you? You are the anochi. Dan anochi. You should be the one to say, save them. Meaning, in the Bible, the, the dialogue between Moses and God is Moshe Rabbeinu says, who am I to take the people out of Egypt? Me anochi, who am I? I'm nothing. It's a sign of humility to the point where God at a certain point gets angry with Moshe and forces him to become. But in the Midrashic reading, when Moshe says, me anochi, playing on the word anochi, who am I? You're the Anochi. Lo kach yiftachta levam ratta vagam et agor shavodu dan Anochi. Lo kach amarta liyakov Anochi erei. Didn't you tell Jacob that I would go down with them and I would bring them up? Veliata Omer. Mi Anochi. And in a sense, you're asking me to do it? Who am I? You're the, you're the Anochi that's supposed to take them out. Amar lo akadosh baruchu, chayecha ani yored umatzilam. By your life, I will go down and save them. So again, in this midrashic reading, even though there's no need to, the reading is turned on its head of a challenge to God. Why aren't you fulfilling your promises? Why aren't you fulfilling the destiny that was promised to Am Yisrael? Again. Another passage, the Gemara in Sanhedrin. Again, when we read the story of Pinchas, which we read a few weeks ago in, in the Kriyata Torah, Pinchas um, is zealous for the Lord, right? God says, um, what's the Pasuk at the beginning of Pinchas? Kineat uh, Kinati, uh, let's Get it out. Dr. Baruch who says, Pinchas ben Lazar, he shivet chamati me al bene Israel, be can owe it kinati betocham, velo chivit it bene Israel, be kinati. So Pinchas is the one who, in the biblical portrait, is zealous for the honor of God. But in the rabbinic passage here in Sanhedrin, it's turned on its head. Pinchas literally picks up Cosby and Zimri 
and slams them on the ground before HaKadosh Baruch Hu. He slams them on the ground. It's an amazing Midrash. Amar Lufanav Ribono Olam. Master of the universe. Al Elu Yiplu Chafdal Elf Misrael. Because of these two people, 24,000 Jews should die. Shanem Abiyum Aitim Magaifa. Vahainu Dichti Vayamod Pinchas Vayif Falel. Doesn't mean that he prayed, but that he stood in judgment. What does it mean he stood in judgment? He stood in judgment of God. Amar Rabbi Lezer, Vayit Palel Lo Nehmar Le Vayif Falel. Melamid Kaviyochol Sha'asa Plilot or plilut im kono. He literally took God to task. He brought him before judgment. Bikshu malachei asharis ledavcho. And the malachei asharis, the angels want to push Pinchas out. Amar lahen hanichalo, kanai ben kanai hu, meshiv chema ben meshiv chema hu. He is an alleviator of the wrath of God. But what's interesting is in this rabbinic reading, he protests, he's not Kanoi of God, he's Kanoi for Am Yisrael. He's a Kanoi for Am Yisrael and the, and the justice that's not fair. And he argues with God and the angels want to push him off. And he, and other uh, examples of that. Now, of course, as I said, this morning, we read a lot of Piyutim and Slichot, where um, the Paitan uh, challenges the Rabbonu Shalom, asks, where is the justice? Where is, where, is the, where is the mercy? Where is the fulfillment of God's promises? The willingness to stand before God. In the midst of that, that's also part of a religious response. There are other Paitanim and there are other people and other slichot that accepted without protest. But again, you have these two urges emerging in a literature, both in rabbinic literature and of course, certainly in the medieval literature. Just take a quick look at the chat. Yeah. And finally, of course, in our tradition, we have the famous protest literature in Hasidut. Um, there are many, many examples of this. One of the famous ones is, of course, the beautiful stories of Rav Levi Yitzchak Mibarditshev. Rav Levi Yitzchak once summoned the tailor and asked him about an argument he had with God. The tailor said, I declared to God, you wish me to repent of my sins, but I have committed only minor offenses. I may have kept leftover cloth or eaten non-kosher food, but you, God, have committed great sins. You have taken babies from their mothers and mothers from their babies. Let's call it even. May you forgive me and I will forgive you. And listening intently, Rav Levi Yitzchak rose in anger and said, why did you let God off so easily? You might have forced God to redeem the whole world. You have the Kaddish, Rav Levi Yitzchak. I, Rav Levi Yitzchak, son of Sar of Bardichev, coming to you in legal manner concerning what do you want of Israel? It is always command the children of Israel is always speak. Merciful Father, how many people are there in the world? Persians, Babylonians, Edomites. What do they say? Our emperor is the emperor. Our kingdom is the kingdom. But I say glorified and sanctified be great name. And I, Levi Yitzchak, I shall not go hence nor budge from my place until there be a finish, until there be an end of the ag exile. Glory, glorified and sanctified be uh, God's name. And of course, this Hasidic um, extension of the argument with God was then taken up, of course, by uh, many popular writers, many of the Yiddish writers um, in, uh, in the dawn uh, of the, the great era of Yiddish writing in the late 19th century. Um, you also have it, of course, in the aftermath of of many, um, of many of the pogroms, uh, many of the poems, uh, famous poems of Bialik uh, uh, and, 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 and some poems of Itzik Manger in Yiddish. And of course, um, during the Holocaust, um, you know, poems about um, uh, a din teira, mit got, uh, din Torah, taking God to task uh, for the events of the Shoah. 
um, and of course in the writings of moderns as well, um, and poetry um, of Yehuda Amichai, um, you know, stark challenges um, to the Rabon Shalom, very famous, uh, famous challenges, and of course in the writings of of Eli Wiesel uh, and Chaim Grada and other uh, other literature, which of course many people are much are familiar with, that. That tradition of protest literature, of protesting the Rabbon Shalom, of oscillating between uh, a kind of uh, acceptance um, at the same time, um, at the same time, to uh, you know, at the same time, the ch challenging God, questioning God, protesting God, uh, and again, Eli Wiesel is the most famous example in our day and age. And in fact, you know, uh, in the late 1990s or early 2000s, I think Wiesel published a, uh, an article in the New York Times where he kind of reconciled with God and all that. This is all part of the Jewish tradition and whether one pushes more the pro side or the con side, but you hear those two voices within the tradition uh, of, uh, of a Kaddish bar of Hengik Taleni Loi Achel at the same time challenging the Rabbon Shalom Lama Zanach Delanetzach. This is part and parcel of something that we think about very deeply on Tisha B'av. So that's what I wanted to uh, share uh, on Tisha B'av. We can't go too deeply into it on Tisha B'av. You're not allowed to go too deeply into what you learn, but this is um, what uh, I wanted to share with people. We have a little bit of time for a break or for any questions people wanted to ask. Thank you very much. Okay. If anybody would like to unmute himself and uh, if I ask any questions, but uh, I guess we go back and forth. With, we go uh, back and forth. Back and a brilliant lecture. Very, very wonderful. And I, I really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thank you. Okay. If uh, there are other questions, we'll take a, a four minute break, a five minute break, and then we'll get started with our film. Uh, we've had lectures, learning, right? The, the third part of our, the, the Tisha B'Av, you know, we haven't had, had a movie yet. So we're not exactly having a movie, but, uh, but Jeremy Glibin is a film producer. He'll be discussing how the Holocaust is portrayed in film. So I think there'll be excerpts here and there. So that's will be the last Achron Achron Chaviv. Anybody who's been here since 11 in the morning gets a special reward. I don't know what that means I get, but uh, whatever. And, uh, what, and uh, everybody, uh, I think it's really amazing. I forgot to mention when I was going all the shimmer having this week, I forgot to mention Rabbi Jonathan Zeering's talk on Thursday on, on Shemitah, the five part series Shemitah into Lens and Torah. That's at 12.15 on Thursday. So please do join us tomorrow, 11 a.m. Like I mentioned, Rabbi Nishi Mervis will be talking on the Ben Ishchai of Baghdad and her, her series on rabbis in the Islamic world, followed by Rabbi Alex Israel on Lord Jonathan Sachs taking a different book of his uh, each week. So that will be tomorrow at 11 a.m. and 1215. Uh, Tisha should be um, a springboard and uh, come and learn with lots of uh, important things and lots of uh, learning to keep us all busy. And uh, you can come with a cup of coffee and some ice cream and waffles, whatever you'd like tomorrow. So that'll be make it maybe a little easier. Actually makes it harder. <laughs> On Tisha B'Av people have nothing to do. So they come and learn during the week. Everybody's busy. Everybody, I understand people got to work. I get it. I get it. Okay. Um, uh, I don't know if you've been there. No, I don't know that that counts. They went with the OU. Should, should we count that, Rav Natty? They came right. an hour late because they were at the OU program until 12. So they missed the first lecture. Yes, I, I think they I don't know if we can forgive them. Yes, okay. Rav Natty, are you going to Camp Stone this year? Uh, yeah, I'm here to Shem in two weeks. Okay, okay. Uh, so you'll probably just miss Azaria because he left already, but he has to come back early because we go off to Israel. Elul is so early this year. Where is he going? Uh, Gush. Very nice. Gush and, uh, so well. Elnat yeah, yeah. was there like in make up machal, you know, he missed last year, so they right. did make up machal, but that was, that's, that's finished already. Anyways, Rabbi Help God, among his many other things, serves, uh, I think, for many years, for a few weeks, as the, one of the camp rabbis in Camp Stone. So, and we spent uh, time together in Camp Stone. So, yes. Very nice. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, okay, okay. Rabbi great, great to see you. Be well. Good and, to see you. Uh, bye bye. Okay. All the best. Thank you. Bye bye.
Mr. Glickman, Shalom Aleichem. Aleichem Shalom. How are you? Doing uh, appropriately miserable on this fine day. Oh, yeah. I... Okay. Yourself? I hear you. I don't know. I'm I'm guilty a little bit of uh, Tisha B'Av being, you know, a day of... Uh, not. It's not standard. I, I just read, somebody posted to read um, Yechaim Seyman's article, you know, the transformation of Tisha B'Av. We were talking with Rabbi Helfkot before. Tisha B'Av day is very, very different than the way it was expand the Shukhanah, movies, lectures, even this learning, this was never done in Jewish history. It's really Rav Soloveitchik who started that. And that's, um, it's made Tisha B'Av so much more meaningful for, for people. And it was interesting, the article says uh, is across the board. Uh, it, it's the more serious Jews who do this. The less serious Jews watch TV on Tisha B'Av or many, most people don't even know it's Tisha B'Av, they're eating, whatever. But uh, anyway, right. so, uh, but uh, okay, what can I say? Even the fact that I'm meeting you for the first time on Tisha B'Av is kind of, you know, interesting. Well, actually, I think we actually have uh, met previously. I think there were some big talks that you organized in Toronto with um, a few a few rabbinim at various times. You may have stopped at the house of a friend of mine to give a public. Uh, oh, sure. Well, I, think we met, I think we met there, and I, I didn't realize that my, my I mean, wife. When we used to bring in our speaker, so yeah. occasionally we yes. would have the speaker yes. go to a private house and say, yeah. I have a discussion yeah. group. Also. Yeah. Whose house did I meet you at? I'd rather not say, but okay, it was. It was okay, but yeah, but it was, I, maybe I shouldn't have asked. Okay, I'm sorry. No, 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 it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It was, but, but we met at one of those. Uh, I think it was. Uh, uh, we. Well, who's the speaker? I can ask you who the speaker. That part. Was. That part makes it more interesting because I can tell you the person we thought we were speaking was actually Rabbi Bright. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So that's an interesting one, uh, okay. but also, also there was a Mark Cohen, Rabbi, Rabbi Mark Cohen, I think was his name. Not, I can't recall. He, I can't remember. I'm sorry if I'm getting his name wrong. He was formerly a, a colleague of Rabbi Bright. And then he, they, they you know. I'm trying and, to think who that is. I can't. Uh, and then there was, and then also there, there was a, there was a, the person did the, did the uh, analysis of the codes of the, of the voicing by computer analysis. Oh, yes, that was Moish, Kip, not Moish Kipel. He did the handwriting analysis. Right. Uh, have to think. I don't know. We've had uh, so many. But, but we met. We met. We met. Okay. I'm. I'm glad to say that. Okay. All right. Are you ready to get started in in a minute or so? I I made you co-host, and of course, when you share your screen, make sure you share the the audio from. Yeah, you absolutely. We'll be able to hear and uh, just uh, talking. Okay. Uh, welcome. What I can say it's Achron Achron Chaviv. This has uh, been a long day, but I hope uh, I trust you found it a meaningful day. I guess if you wouldn't, you wouldn't be here, but. Uh, um, we, we appreciate all the people who've come. And uh, again, I want to thank the, the Zeichman family. I don't know if any of the Zeichmans are still on, but uh, for sponsoring it here in Toronto in memory of their parents, Meyer and Sylvia you know, Zeichman here in Toronto. And uh, I want to thank them. And I want to thank all of you for coming to learn and to helping uh, making Tisha B'Av an inspiring day. Uh, our last speaker, Achron Achron Khabib, Jeffrey Glivin is a, a movie producer and he's been working in film for, for many years. We, and uh, so he's going to show how the Holocaust is depicted in film. And with that, Akasha, it's all yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, normally we would begin with uh, good evening and uh, welcome, except it's Tisha B'Av, so we don't say that. So I will not be saying good evening and welcome. And I'm sure at this point in the day, everybody is... Uh, rather famished and you know looking forward to eating something thankfully our topic today is uh, a solid appetite suppressant so good on that um, a few uh, a few uh, caveat emptors to start off a few things to, to start off before we begin one um, uh, I will be showing a few clips here and there I have more of a presentation to get to which I'll start right now um, and we'll, we'll start with this just as a basic uh, uh, outline. Um, there are many, many Holocaust films that have been made over the past 80 years. Um, we will not be talking about all of them. We'll be talking about some of them. The ones that I've picked are the ones that I believe either represent a um, paradigm shift in the representation of the Shoah on film or uh, it represents something as far as moving the, the medium forward, moving the um, moving the the content or the style of films, which are actually related. They're actually two related topics. There, the sort of 
have a historical value in terms of sort of moving things forward. That what I consider to be kind of the the the, the turning points, the major turning points. Um, the first thing I'd just like to start off with is why the question why why is the Holocaust such a ripe uh, uh, topic for filmmaking? It might for for movies. It might be immediately obvious to everybody listening. It might be feel like a redundant like a an un, un, unnecessary question, but there's a couple of things you might want to consider. One is that um, uh, the large part of why they are so um, important is because, or why they're so easy to, to use as a backdrop for film is because the, the Nazis all, all kind of represent Yamach Shemam. By the way, if I said Yamach Shemam every time I said Nazis in this speech, I'm going to be saying it every third word. So just assume from now and henceforth for the rest of the talk, anytime I say the word Nazis, it goes along with a Yamach Shemam. Um, the Nazis are kind of the ultimate villains in the context of a film. Why? Because the scope of what they were able to do was massive. The um, level of violence, the level of, of evil that was pr present in their actions was pretty astounding. And more importantly, they were very dispassionate about it. It was an extremely intellectual endeavor. Um, and that makes um, all of the actions that they took that much more kind of beguiling, fascinating, uh, not understanding in movies. When there's a villain, if he's furious for revenge, that's one thing. But if he's just doing this as an intellectual example uh, or an intellectual uh, um, pursuit, it makes it much scarier. So that's one of the reasons why we return to the Holocaust again and again. Um, obviously, it doesn't matter to us. We return to the Holocaust for, for our own reasons, which is what I'll we'll get to, start getting to as we go on. Um, another reason um, why it's just so, uh, so something we go, come back to is it is modern history um, and the, extent, the, the attempted extermination of our people is a huge source of conflict, of tragedy, of victimization, of heroism. There's every level of exploration of drama exists within the Shoah. So over the next hour or so, I'm going to cover uh, 10 to 12 films. I'm going to mention a few others. Um, and we're going to talk about everything from genre, which is not, um, uh, that's a loaded term. Genre can mean a bunch of different things. I'll get to that in a bit. Um, in this context, it's the type of story that's being presented, the, the, the narrative structure. We'll talk a lot about stylistic qualities, which may sound like, what do I care about the stylistic qualities? It, it connects to the content. It connects to the way in which the content was presented and what that represents to historically how, how, the, how we perceived and how the show was shown to an audience. You got to remember, most of the people today, their largest access point into the idea of the Holocaust, the Holocaust element of World War II from 1939 to 1945 is through movies. So these are extremely valuable texts. These are extremely important documents that we have to sort of look into that future generations are only going to have this. You know, we're not going to have survivors for only so long, unfortunately. Um, and, um, and finally, we're, we're going to look at how the presentation of the Shoah changed over the years. So where do we start? The obvious question is, what was the first Holocaust film ever made? So like all good questions, it's a machalikas. <laughs> it's, a, uh, it's a debate. There isn't one clear answer. But from my perspective, the first actual film re revolving around the Holocaust that actually identified Jews as a player in the aspect of German um, uh, German invasion and German um, persecution of peoples was a comedy. It's To Be or Not To Be, which is a film that was made by Ernst Lubitsch, okay? Ernst Lubitsch was a Jewish filmmaker who left Germany in 1922. He was well regarded as a brilliant vaudeville and theater producer and director. He had an incredible eye, an incredible ability with staging and with being subtle and with being very um, sophisticated in his presentation of things. What he was truly amazing at was uh, married, married couples relationships. He was fantastic at portraying the frustration, the... Um, the sort of uh, uh, the friction, the uh, love and the care that a married couple can go through during various times in, the, in, their, in their lives. Um, and he was a master at this. He developed a reputation when he came over to Hollywood for having this, this quality called the Lubitsch touch. The Lubitsch touch was a, 
a way of saying, ah, when you see that film and you see what the way he's dealt with those scenes, it's got the Lubitsch touch. So what is to be or not to be? To be or not to be is a comedy that um, centers around a theater troupe, a Polish theater troupe, okay? Lubitsch knew of what was going on in Germany. To what degree he knew is, we'll come back to that in a second because it, it, this, this film is very instructive for bringing up the question, what was known? What was known in North America about what was going on? This is a question that people of my generation, of, of, of many of the people asking, how, what was really known? What was going on in, 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 um, in Europe at the time in North America? It's a huge question. And oftentimes the answer is kind of, we're not sure, we don't know, you know, we, we didn't know what was going on. This, that, to look into this film, you actually get a very clear answer that a lot of what was going on was not known. So what is, I'll give you a brief synopsis of the film. The film is about a Polish theater troupe uh, that, is, uh, that is the main theater troupe in Warsaw. And at the center of the theater troupe are uh, stars, um, uh, Joseph Tura and Maria Tura, played by Jack Benny and Carol Lombard on screen in front of you here. Jack Benny uh, was cast by Ernst Lubitsch on purpose. He wanted somebody with the exact sort of um, uncomfortability that he had because Joseph Tura in the movie is a bad actor, constantly uh, desiring for attention. Um, they're rehearsing in the, in the beginning of the movie, they're in the middle of rehearsing a play that's going to make fun of Hitler. Um, Everything goes through, and, and, and uh, Joseph Tour has a problem. When they're not doing this play, rehearsing this, what they're always doing, going back to their repertory Hamlet. Joseph Tour comes out onto stage to say, to be or, to say that to be or not to be soliloquy, soliloquy from Hamlet. He's playing the, you know, King Hamlet. And he always notices that a young, very handsome airman is getting up from the theater and walking out of the theater when he's giving the soliloquy night after night. The airman's going back to visit Maria Tour backstage. Um, that's what's going on. So this creates a bit of tension amongst the whole theater troupe and amongst everybody. And then all of a sudden, boom, the story gets set into motion when the Germans bomb Warsaw. And all of a sudden the entire theater troupe is, everything is sent into chaos. The theater troupe is sent into having to work with the resistance. The plot is extremely complicated. I don't really want to, I can't really summarize the whole thing uh, because it's actually quite complicated in all of its elegance. It's, it's still a very complicated plot, but the general gist is that um, the, th the, the, the troop ends up having to work with the resistance. They're trying to intercept a double agent, uh, a Polish agent who's traveling back to Poland from England named Selecki. They have to fool him into thinking that they are the Nazis, that he is a, a, a Colonel Earhart, the Jack Benny's Colonel Earhart, so that he can give them the list of names, which includes the list of his wife, uh, the name of his wife, Maria Tora, for people who are going to get killed. Um, a it, it, Every time they solve a problem, another one occurs. First, Soletsky's on to them. They have to kill Soletsky. Then, then Joseph Tura has to pretend to be Soletsky, going in to meet the actual Colonel Earhart. It, it keeps on going like this. But the, but the climax of the film uh, revolves around when they, in order to escape, they all have to be at the theater where the actual Fuhrer, Hitler himself, is coming to the theater to, to see a show that they're supposed to perform for him. And in order to create this distraction, they use Greenberg, the one Jewish member of the troop. It's not, it, it is pretty much explicitly stated that he's a Jewish member of the troop and that he's, and that, you know, he's a Jew. And their only way of dealing with it is to cause a huge distraction in the, in the, in the uh, lobby of the, of the theater and where Greenberg will deliver the Shylock monologue, have not a Jew eyes, have not a Jew hands, most of you already know it. 